we jumped at it. We took it. You know, that was the fight that I wanted at 140 when he was still world champion. I I felt like I could beat him back then, and I'm certain that I can beat him now. All right, joining me now, one of the best young fighters in all of boxing, 147-pound contender, uh, Virgil Ortiz, who will face his toughest opponent to date. We takes on Maurice Hooker on Saturday in Fort Worth, Texas. That's a fight you can see live on the zone. Virgil joins me here on the show. Virgil, before I get to your fight, uh, you were one of the first people I saw on social media uh, reflecting on the passing of Marvin Hagler. And uh, you're obviously a young guy, uh, too young to have seen Hagler fight uh, when he was active. But uh, were you a Hagler fan? Do you, have you Did you watch his old footage? I mean, what were your, your memories of him? I um I mean I never met the guy. I wish I I wish I met him. Um, you know he's definitely a legend in the sport of boxing. But I mean I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that he he was a part of the best first round in all of boxing. You know against Hearns, and uh, you know that's just that's one of the fights that I actually have seen. You know from back then because you know I, I'm not really a big actual fan of boxing. So the his fights were actually some of the fights that I actually watched. Well, it doesn't take long to watch Hagler Hearns, eight minutes yeah. <laughs> before, uh, when that one ended, but it was the best first round probably in boxing history. Certainly you can make the argument for that. I, you know, when I saw you tweet that, I, you know, you, you start thinking about Hagler and his legacy and you, you do have a, you have a little Hagler in you, Virgil, honestly, you're like, you're just a big, strong, physical guy who, kind of comes comes at you is relentless with pressure like that's what Hagler was like and he just wore guys down whether it took three rounds like Hearns or you know going the distance with the Durans and, and several others yeah no he was a monster in the in the ring and yeah like you said it's, it's sad that we uh we had a legend pass so early in his life you know he wasn't even that old and you know he was uh he was young uh, he I mean he was definitely uh like young for his age, you know, like physically. And, uh, you know, it's just sad to see that. And I just, uh, you know, my condolences to his family and may he rest in peace. No question. So you got one fight in, in 2020, you fought Samuel Vargas, you stopped him in the seventh round. 2020 was a tough year for everybody, but what was it like for you? Uh, 2020, long story short, sucked. I thought that that was my breakout year. I thought that I was going to get in three to four fights, uh, you know, closer to a, a world title fight. Um, I mean, you know, the good thing for me is, you know, I'm, I'm barely 22. I still have the rest of my 20s to go to to get those uh, good fights, those potential fights. And um, 2020 could have been a lot better, but it's uh, it's it's only a, a bump in the road for me. Were you staying in camp during that time, hoping to get one more fight before the end of the year, or had you had had you accepted that that July fight was all you were going to get? I was training the entire time. I wasn't in camp in California, but I was definitely still in the gym training every day, still doing my strength conditioning as if I was in camp. So, yes and no. So I just wasn't getting any sparring because you know with the whole COVID thing, right? Right. So when Maurice Hooker is presented to you as a potential opponent, what's your reaction? Oh, we, we jumped at it. We took it. You know, that was the fight that I wanted at 140 when he was still a world champion. I, I felt like I could beat him back then, and I'm certain that I can beat him now. Why was, why was he the target for you? Because, you know, I just, um, I just knew I could beat him. You know, there's just certain fighters that you see that, you're like, yeah, I, I could take him, you know, like no question. Um, and he had a world title. So, you know, my chances were slim of getting that fight. You know, I barely had, I think maybe 11 fights at the time when, when I wanted the fight, but you know, I, I asked Eddie Hearn, I asked him in the press conference in front of everyone. He kind of laughed at it, but I, I didn't get the fight, but I'm getting it now. So that's what matters. Were you surprised that he wanted to face you? Um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, J just, uh, I seen one of his interviews. He said, he, like, he said, no hesitation. He said, yeah, I'm like, okay, cool. It's kind of weird to see how everything changes. You know, <laughs> now you want to fight me. <laughs> Why do you think he wanted to fight you now? Um, maybe because I, um, 
I'm probably one of the most, how, how do I say? I, I've made a name for myself, but I don't exactly have that name yet. Like, you know, like Danny Garcia or Keith Thurman. I'm not there yet, but I'm there. And I feel mm-hmm. like he thinks I would be a good, uh, a good, like, measuring stick, a good, good uh, welcome to 147 fight. Do you feel like he's a measuring stick for you? Um, I definitely feel like people are seeing it like that. They're, they want to see if I'm the real deal. They want, you know, he's been in there with the best. He's been some tough guys. Um, I've seen his uh, box rec. You know, he's been, uh, they've been trying to beat him. Like, whoever been matching him up has definitely been trying to beat him. He fought, like, four or five undefeated fighters in a row and beat him, you know? So, you know, he's definitely been in there with some tough fighters. And, um, yeah, uh, I think that it would probably be a good measuring stick to see, uh, you know, hopefully if I get the win, see if I can get a, a, a bigger name. You are a stable mate of Jose Ramirez, who fought Mario Soker back in the summer of 2019. Uh, what do you remember about that fight? I mean, aside from Jose winning, I, I remember uh, just Jose just relentless pressure. Just he was just on him the whole time, and Maurice didn't really know what to do. And you know, Maurice did have his moments where he, uh, where he would hit back and get his combinations in, but it wasn't really effective. Does that give you any kind of blueprint for how? you would face him? We we have some sort of blueprint, but, you know, we're not going to copy exactly what Jose did. You know, Jose is one fighter. I'm another fighter. We, we don't fight the same. We don't have the same strengths. But, um, yeah, we, we, I mean, we're definitely going to take some stuff from that fight. You have 16 knockouts with your 16 wins, but, I, I like, all knockouts, of course, not created equal. If you knock out Mari Sucker that would be a pretty significant accomplishment, a fighter of, of Hooker's stout, uh, caliber. Uh, do you look at that? I mean, do you think that, you know, stopping him, would that mean more to you than some of the other ones? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I feel like Marie Hooker, you know, he's uh, he's probably the most dangerous fighter to date in my career. You know, he's, he's, not, uh, he's not old. He's 31 years old. He's still in his prime. He's, uh, you know, he's just, he just moved up in weight. You know, some people take it as a bad thing, but really he's coming up to 147 for the first time. He's not going to struggle in weight. He's going to feel good. His body's going to feel strong. Um, he's been a world champion before recently. And I think all of that just, just adds to uh, his caliber. When you, when you look at the last couple of years, you're still only 20. 20- years old you've got Robert Garcia behind you you've clearly grown as a fighter at least in my eyes in the last couple of years and you know as you were the consensus prospect of the year a year ago a lot of people feel the same way how do you feel like you've grown as a fighter over the last two years I mean I feel like I feel like I've matured in in the ring you know I feel like I've I've picked my shots better I feel like I've physically gotten bigger um I mean, other than that, you know, I just definitely just smarter. I've been making smarter moves. Do you still feel comfortable at 147? Yes, I do. We saw your Golden Boy stablemate, Ryan Garcia, uh, have a breakout performance against Luke Campbell. I see some similarities, not necessarily in style, but in opponent in Mari Sucker, you know, a, a credible, you know, former world champion, you know, somebody people know. And, you know, Ryan... Uh, again, that was kind of a coming out party for him. Do you look at this fight as being maybe something of a coming out party for you? Yeah, it, it could be something like that. You know, it's uh, it's definitely a fight that I see that's going to open up a lot more doors than, than the rest of my fights that I've gotten. What's the door you hope it opens? The world title shot. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I feel like that's that's just what I've been fighting for this whole time. Like literally, like you see my record, sixteen and over sixteen knockouts. I I had to literally have that perfect record, all those knockouts to get where I'm at right now in my career. I've had to do it perfectly, and uh, I think it's only fair that I get my shot. Do you get any sense that that shot is going to be available to you this year? Uh, I I believe so. I think it could be. Which in in what way? 
Um, without jumping too far ahead, I think that it would be Crawford. You think Crawford? I mean, look, I'd love to see it. Everybody would love to see it. I just question whether Crawford would take it given where he is in his career and the risk you present. I mean, I don't, I don't see why he wouldn't take it. Um, I'm sure he's more uh, than confident in his ability, you know, to fight me. I think that with him being top rank and me being with Golden Boy, that the fight is more than makeable. You know, they, we've seen uh, Bob Arum, Master La Jolla, and Eric Gomez talk about it in in their little lunch that they had. Um, I'm number two in the WBO. Uh, Maurice Hooker is his stablemate. You know, there's too many coincidences going on for that fight not to happen. No, it's a, it's a good point. You could send a message to the Crawford stable to Brian McIntyre, the trainer for Hooker and Crawford, with a pretty impressive performance in this fight. That, yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. <laughs> Just after the fight, sort of say, Hooker was first, Terrence, you're next. Yeah, I mean, that basically, right. <laughs> is that, I mean, how, how long has a fight with Crawford been kind of on your radar? I mean, you're young, you've been coming up the ranks. I mean, when did it start to crystallize for you that, all right, you know, I, I'm ready for a Terrence Crawford? When I, okay, so obviously maybe like two years ago, I didn't think so. You know, Crawford, mm-hmm. you know, he's on top of his game even now. Um, maybe with, within like in 2020, you know, you know, we, you know, we obviously really got to think with ourselves in that year because we couldn't do anything else. And, uh, <laughs> I was training and, uh, I'm, I'm still getting better in the ring, whether I'm fighting or not. And I, I don't know. I just think, uh, as, as the days go on, it just started getting clearer and clearer. You know what? The Errol Spence fight is not going to happen anytime soon. So, Maybe maybe the Crawford fight is the way to go. So when you're not training in 2020 and you can't get a fight, what is Virgil Ortiz doing? I'm still training, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. I, I'm still training, but um, you know I'm 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 in my room. I'm playing uh, my my PS4. I'm I'm running. I like to run. I don't like to run because of boxing or anything. I like to run because I can listen to my music. I'm alone. I'm in my own world, you know, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, I used to read a lot. I don't I don't read a whole lot anymore. I think I'm going to start again. I recently started playing chess. I, I love chess now. I'm not that good, but <laughs> I, I'm learning. I'm learning. I want to bring a chess board with me then to Texas, see if we can uh, get, get, it. get a game going. I'm, I'm probably on your level. Like, I'm average chess. I know, I know the rules, but that's uh, strategy. Yeah, man, man, I blunder a lot, bro. Don't, like, chess me. Like, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll see a sure win, and bam, there goes my queen. Yeah, you're going to hustle me. I'm sure about that. Um, the uh, This is your first fight back in Texas since you fought Orozco uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, how do you feel about fighting in your backyard near your hometown? How does, Is that something that appeals to you? Is that something you'd like to do a lot more going forward? Or do you prefer kind of, you know, the the other locations? I, I definitely love fighting at home. Uh, I want to – I don't want to necessarily fight there all the time because – I just feel like it's too much of a good thing. I, I would like to fight in different places and then, then come back home and then, you know, fight again. And, you know, I just want to make it feel like something special, not not just something that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. And no question. Before I let you go, um, you've seen some some drama with Golden Boy of the last six months with Canelo and Ryan and things like that. How have you, how are you with, with Golden Boy, with Oscar? What is your situation like? I mean, we're, we're good, you know. Um, you don't hear anything about it because we're, we're good. Uh, you know, text me what's up from time to time. I tell him what's up. It's uh, it, it's pretty good over here. It's good. Good. Good to hear it, Virgil. Well, we're looking forward to you Saturday night live on zone Ortiz Hooker. Uh, big event, big night, and a big moment for you. Uh, we'll see you Saturday. All right. See you soon.